I will try to share with you some personal uh, thoughts uh, on the diagnosis and uh, the way to approach lateral epicondylitis after we talk about the standards of the diagnosis. Now we call it lateral elbow tendinopathy, that's the official term, but uh, uh, several times we use, I still use the lateral epicondylitis term. The tendons affected uh, are mostly ECRB, I would say more than 90%, and then the others. And don't forget that the posterior lateral uh, tendons, uh, like triceps and tagonios, may have some uh, uh, irritation, in, uh, especially in, post, uh, uh, in throwers and the weightlifters, uh, called the posterior tennis elbow. Crucial. Uh, part of the diagnosis is history. Uh, also, local tenderness is very important for me. I start uh, palpating the origin of the ECRB and going down to the origin of uh, EDC. Uh, I would say that 90%, as I said, uh, have the EC, uh, ECRB affected uh, and 10% uh, uh, EDC. I, I've never seen um, uh, ED, ECRL uh, tendinosis. Uh, the tests are very well known. Uh, if a patient comes uh, in the clinic with pain in the lateral shoulder, the first thing uh, uh, that they check is uh, uh, the tenderness and the resisted wrist extension. I check always the shoulder and the wrist motion and uh, muscle strength. Uh, and uh, if the history, the occupation, the sports, uh, uh, the local tenderness and the, and the age are all positive and the range of motion of the shoulder and the wrist are very good, I stop there. I'm sure that it's a lateral uh, epicondylitis and then I treat it uh, uh, conservatively in the beginning and most of the times conservative treatment is the final treatment. Always ask for a previous injury. If they, there's a fresh injury or an injury that is within the, the year, uh, you can have an occult fracture uh, there m might be uh, s uh, some ligamentous injury uh, and um, always ask for shoulder and wrist injury as well, not only for the elbow, because if you have stiffness in any of those joints, uh, you may get secondary lateral epicondylitis. Uh, in the beginning of uh, my practice, uh, I didn't believe the patients that uh, uh, were coming in the clinic uh, saying that I had a direct blow or a sudden extreme effort. But with time, I see two, three patients a year saying that and denying any, uh, any chronic problem. You have uh, to check for tenderness, the lateral epicondyle, as I said, but also the extensor muscle mass. If you have uh, um, a mobile wood that is uh, tender, you probably don't have to do with a lateral epicondylitis. Always compared to the normal side because we know that there are many patients who, who are sensitive everywhere. We have to, uh, to keep in mind that the articular pathologists may mimic a lateral epicondylitis. As I said, the nocal fracture uh, and UCL instability, I had uh, three patients with uh, lateral elbow pain uh, that had an injury in the past, and uh, actually they had. Uh, LUCL instability and the needed reconstruction. Uh, loose bodies are rarely seen. Uh, also, a posterior lateral plica, I never operated on one of those. Uh, keep in mind that the posterior or lateral impingement in valgus uh, extension stress may mimic also the lateral epicondylitis. This is usually seen in uh, uh, throwing athletes. And uh, I've seen one this year in a, a judo athlete. I've also seen uh, two patients with bone marrow edema. I could not give a good diagnosis and got an MRI. And then I saw that one of the patients had uh, shoulder stiffness, a painter with um, shoulder impingement syndrome. That was, uh, the patient was using his uh, arm in a different way 
uh, bad use. And uh, the, the edema was diffuse in, bo in both sides as we see it in the knee. So we treated the, the shoulder and the problem went away. Uh, the, the other patient had a, a bone marrow edema without uh, any other problems and uh, we treated it uh, as we treated knee uh, bone swelling. I've also seen uh, three cases with uh, cysts uh, and uh, benign tumors. Uh, one of them was an osteoid osteoma without any nocturnal uh, pain, without any other symptoms, with tenderness over the uh, epicondyle. Took an MRI, saw the lesion. We treated the osteoid osteoma. The pain went away. I don't know if, we, if it was a, just a, a random finding or but, but the pain uh, went away. Um, I've seen two bone cysts. One was looking like a remnant of an older osteochondritis desiccans, and the other one was breaking the, um, the uh, cortex, uh, I would say three, four centimeters uh, proximal in the distal uh, arm. Uh, they, they did well conservatively. The other things that we have to, the other category that uh, we have to keep in mind is uh, uh, neuropathy. Radial nerve entrapment was, uh, uh, was also described by the previous talkers. Uh, cervical radiculopathy and brachial plexus, mostly postural. Now, what I usually do when I have uh, doubt in uh, the diagnosis, I check the uh, shoulder and wrist range of motion and strength, uh, see if uh, the pain is in the lateral epicondyle or in the extension mass, and uh, if we see that the extension mass is uh, more tender, the diagnosis of uh, lateral epicondylitis uh, um, is not the most possible. They may coexist, lateral epicondylitis and the extension mass, but uh, uh, weak, uh, tenderness, but uh, when I see tendons in the extension mass, then I check more thoroughly the shoulder and the wrist for uh, reduced radial motion. I see for uh, uh, radial nerve entrapment. Uh, and uh, I also check the cervical spine and the brachial plexus clinically. Uh, an easy way to, ex to see if uh, the neck is uh, involved is the extension or retention test, the extend and rotate to the ipsilateral side and see if we have a reproduction of the symptoms. Uh, if there is uh, numbness, it's easy to say that is, uh, it, it comes from the uh, cervical spine. Uh, if there is no numbness but there is pain, the two uh, problems may coexist or I think that as we say for the double crash symptom, the syndromes, if you have a nerve that is pinched in the beginning of the nerve, in the brachial plexus or in the cervical spine, and you have an inflammation, a tendinopathy at the area that uh, the nerve goes, it acts uh, the same way. You ex it exacerbates the symptoms that you have from the, er the area that uh, has the problem. So keep in mind that you have to check the cervical spine and brachial plexus and more and more with time, I use the Tinel sign as I use it for the double crash syndrome in the medial arm. I tap the medial arm and see how, what happens, and also tap the posterior neck, neck, neck triangle. And uh, then I palpate the posterior neck triangle and uh, compare it to the other side and see if the, there's any difference. If there is a significant difference, I know that something goes wrong. And it's not only a lateral condylitis. I don't know which came first, but. Uh, it's not a simple uh, epicondylitis, and it will take more time for that to treat. If I don't find, uh, uh, I don't get the diagnosis after all that findings, I try an injection with local anesthetic, two cc, uh, one with a fast one and one with a slow one, uh, and uh, check again. If the pain has disappeared, then the patient can extend the wrist without any pain. 
then I, ha I know that I have to do with a lot of condylitis and I treat it like that. If we, have, uh, we still have pain after that, and after six hours with uh, use of the, in the everyday activities, uh, I know that uh, something goes wrong and uh, it's not a lateral epicondylitis. That is the time that I decide to get a, an imaging uh, test. Uh, um, actually, an MRI, usually, and in, uh, in some cases, uh, ultrasonography. Thank you.